Hey guys, Mike here. So today we're gonna look at Palantir stock and all the stuff that's come out this week and it's a whole lot of news. We're gonna try to cram into this one video for you to get everybody caught up. You know, we're gonna go over obviously the big news, why ARK has dumped it like hotcakes. They hold a few shares. I'll show you exactly how many they have left, but they're going out of the position for sure. And why that actually, some people think that's probably the best thing short term for this company right now. And then we're gonna go over, you know, there's a great interview this guy did about why they're concerned, they're analysts, why they're concerned about the SPAC investments and why that revenue should be backed out and what investors should be looking for on that part of it. And then we're going to go over some other concerns. You know, I don't know if you'll call them concerns or whatever, but things you need to be looking out for that will affect Palantir not only next week and then, you know, coming March, which is going to be an interesting month, but I'm talking about for the rest of, you know, probably two to three years, okay? Things you need to be looking for and tracking, especially during every single uh, earnings call for sure and then we'll go over the chart and kind of show you is there any support left where's the support at and then you know what's the next thing we'll be looking for coming up here soon okay so if you're getting out of it hit that like and subscribe button for me guys make sure you hit alerts all so you get all notifications especially if you're a member and let's go ahead and get into arc invest first and how much do they have left you look here guys you can see right now in the main fund they got a whopping 334 shares left you can see on february 24th they had 24 and a half million art q a whopping 1297 uh you got art w 210 shares art g 220 shares and i see arc f 207 and lastly arc x 200 so that should be gone over the next 30 days and what's funny about this is you know the losses are just enormous. I mean, if you look right here when she was purchasing and you look, it was around March. I mean, she's purchasing around $21.88 on that day. So somewhere over, over $20 for sure, right? And then in November, she makes a big purchase of 1.5 million more shares. And you look over there and it's going around $22.52 right there. And then if you look at any other big purchases, you know, around, what is this, 17.3 million shares she built up going through March and so are by the end of march and so she's purchasing anywhere from 20 to 24 dollars somewhere in there now and then you got another big purchase in august um, she ends up getting 5.6 million shares in that time range and if you look there in august where we're at uh, somewhere between like 22 and 25 dollars and so you know you can see she wrote it all the way down to around 11 before they sold out and so massive loss about that what was funny though to me is i was looking at some of these purchases she recently made like she purchased open door right she still holds open door 1.5 million shares and obviously she purchased it the day they were going to report earnings and you can see right there the stock dropped 23 percent after that purchase right there and when she bought open door it was extremely expensive it was much higher than it is now and so but she continues to hold that once so i guess they're more innovative than palantir and one reason you know people are saying this might be the best thing for palantir especially short term is because it gets you know them off the radar so to speak for short sellers right because arc is being targeted i mean an etf was created just to short arc funds and so you know it's been a big target it's been a big conversation some people don't believe that some people do but you know if she's not man i mean i don't know what to say about it because it seems like she's definitely been targeted and she's really admitted that like really it's drove by algorithms that she can't believe she's been the arc invest alone is really being targeted and so some people think that's good and plus some people are looking at the history of some of the purchases she made, right? I showed you open door, but you know, if you look at what she did with Virgin Galactic, right? They dumped the shares and then like right after that, it, it went up 170%. You know, she dumped Snap just last month in January. They report earnings, they go up 50% off their earnings call, right? She has this history. It's not her. She's not sitting in front of a computer going, sale, right? It's just how they set their algorithms and what they decide to do. But it's like their timing on the sale seems to be not the best in most of these stocks because they tend to go up rapidly. So some people are going to look at this, you know, very closely to see if where Palantir goes, right? And so I'll be tracking it. I know you will be. It's just an interesting thing. And so some people think because Palantir will almost be off the radar now because it's not in their fund anymore, that that may help them in the short term. We will see and maybe long term. Who knows? And so, you know, and you know, why do they sell? Basically because they kind of referenced the government uh, you know, purchase or the government contract slowing down as one. Um, the innovation part, they really didn't address. So I don't really understand that part because the whole point, whatever I was wanting the Palantir to do was their government contracts or you know revenues to start shrinking in percentage wise versus their commercial contracts. So it seems like that's what they're trying to do. 
but you know something spooked them and they got out very fast a lot faster than they do a lot of other positions okay and so you know that leads us into this other guy's an analyst and you know he's talking about the SPAC contracts right and really how that revenue should be backed out how people should be concerned about it and hey guess what he makes some good points and in your most recent note you say if you back out some of these SPAC contributions commercial growth would be would be much much weaker this whole thing doesn't sound good. It sounds like they're making investments in SPACs in return for contracts. Is that what's going on here? Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I mean, uh, th there's a number of these <coughs> contracts out there where uh, Palantir is invested often in um, you know pre-revenue companies, companies that are you know going public via the, the SPAC route. And in those contracts, it, it it has provisions where those customers or those companies turn around and uh, use those proceeds to buy Palantir software. So uh, there, there's a very clear line here. Um, and in fact, Palantir discloses the amount of revenue from those uh, SPAC companies so investors can do the math. But I think the key point is it is a big growth driver for them in the commercial business. And I think um, our concern is just that that's a lower quality growth driver <laughs> as investors um, excuse me, evaluate the performance of the company. Just to play the other side of it, I mean, what is the risk to this strategy? I mean, you say it's lower quality growth. I mean, it's lower quality, I guess, because it's not, um, you know, they're not customers who actively want Palantir services, but they're customers who are sort of, I don't want to say coerced, but <laughs> almost like yeah. a quid pro quo going on here. What's the downside here? Why well, not? There's <laughs> nothing wrong. They're disclosing everything. It's, yeah. still, it's revenue. What's wrong with it? Right. Well, I, I think the, the concern is that, you become dependent on the SPAC market, which clearly market conditions where we're at now, you know, there's not as many new SPACs as there were over the last couple of quarters. So if that becomes kind of your, your dependency on growth and the, the SPAC pooling dries up, that's, that's a big issue. Obviously the, the conflict of interest, um, you know, I think this is viewed pretty controversially by uh, investors. And then, you know, frankly, just from a uh, net income perspective, they had to take a huge write down on these SPAC investments. I think, um, you know, this past quarter, uh, their loss on a lot of these SPAC revenue uh, contracts was, was greater than, um, you know, any revenue that they've actually earned. So um, from a pure mathematic perspective, it, it isn't working out well. And obviously, um, I think these types of arrangements just don't set you up for sustainable growth, which is ultimately what uh, investors are looking for. Tyler, it's Karen. So getting to this sustainable growth issues, to the extent the, step, the SPAC market has kind of imploded, you're going to have tons of SPACs that don't get a deal done, right? So that's a need to be dissolved or, I mean, I guess they, some of them will be renewed for some amount of time. But so those would end up being probably short-term contracts relative to the very sticky ones that Palantir likes to have their book be, stickier long-term contracts. How do you think about valuing those? Yeah, I think I think that's another great point. I mean, I think um, you know the 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 growth drivers thus far for for the company. I mean, they've largely been large government contracts, large corporate contracts, and so you know these smaller ones. I think it's it's really hard to to hold that on the same level. You know, it's not a a government or a, a you know a large entity like a Fortune five hundred company that has deep pockets, right? And so um, you know, I think. Our concern is just that investors are going to sign a, a lower valuation multiple uh, for a business that's kind of dependent on this funding mechanism. And so, look, does he make good points? Yeah, there's some good points in there. No doubt. First of all, that, that actually the price they bought the SPACs at, obviously nobody knew SPACs were going to just die off like this. You know, that's a big loss. Will they come back? We'll see. I mean, not every SPAC is going to, you know, survive. But if you look at the SPACs they're going into, it's, it's data-driven SPACs, right? I mean, that's what they're all about is data-driven my thoughts are they're trying to get on the ground floor of it and i don't think they're forcing any company to use their software i mean i think a lot of people have said even our own government here that their software works okay and so yeah you make some good points you know i'm not a, i'm not a fanboy of any stock so i can admit when somebody's making some good points and they are and so we'll see how that plays out in the long run how those companies you know do but one reason a lot of spikes go down is because they, you know, promise these revenues and then they give you these revenues. I mean, that's what you see happening. That's why you see SPACs going down the tubes. Plus, more importantly, they have a lot of pipe investors. It's set up totally different uh, than your traditional IPO. And so they just sell out as soon as the lockup's done. And so that's another thing you see happening as well. And, of course, the market just hates SPACs in general. And so we'll see how that goes. 
Um, you know, but so he makes good points. Let me know in the comments what you think about that. Um, you know, the other big one is, and I think this is something this kind of leads us into something to think about is, you know, one thing we got to watch like a hawk. And I showed you what the CEO said about this is the stock based compensation, right? The good news is it has been decreasing. As you can see in 2020, the number right there, I highlight for you. And you can see it is cut in half in 2021. And the CEO said it will start to be normalized over probably the next one to two years. And the reason why it's extremely important because on a non gap basis, they're actually profitable. But one of the biggest reasons they're not profitable on a gap basis is the stock based compensation. Okay. And so that if it continues to decrease, especially at the pace it is now, they will obviously be profitable probably somewhere 2024, 20, probably in a couple of years. If that's the case, obviously their investment costs also uh, are making them non profitable. But I think this is the big one. And this one also puts a sour taste in the mouth of stockholders when you're, you know, obviously diluting your shareholders to reward uh, the um, employees you have, which is not a bad thing, but still they do it more than other software companies. And he even addressed that. And so he finally realizes that, which I think is a good thing uh, about time. And so, you know, the other one is it, the analysts don't like this stock, right? I mean, it, the majority of Palantir is owned by in, uh, retail investors, not institutions. As you can see, I mean, you got eight analysts covering this. You got one buy, three holds, and four sales. And just, you know, five days ago, Citigroup put out a sale, a $10 price target, Credit Suisse 15 on a hold. Morgan Stanley says sale 10 days ago. Uh, Wolf says uh, hold. Uh, RBC says sell 11 days ago. Dutch Bank says hold. And then, of course, you got Jeffries at $21, about 27 days ago. So it would have been uh, before earnings. So I'm not sure what they think now. And then, you know, if you just look right here at the inside, as you got them uh, selling, insiders the selling, you know, on the way down. A lot of them say it's because of tax reasons, that kind of stuff, you know, but this puts a sour, you know, taste in a lot of shareholders, um, you know, mouths. And plus, institutions tend to shy away from companies that do have a lot of insider selling, even though all of them are uninformed sales and stuff. And you can click on the links if you have a tip ranks account to see exactly why they were selling. And this kind of leads us into an interesting idea I'd heard floated, which I think is going to happen was was actually just kind of splitting the company almost into two and, and getting gotham into its own entity and allowing foundry which is the newer software to go forward uh, along with apollo and then whatever else they create uh, underneath that umbrella just because gotham is the oldest right and, i mean you can see right here gotham's been around a very long time compared to foundry and apollo and so you know and, and foundry really is what people consider the future as well as apollo and so that would actually help them. I do not see that happening at all. And the other thing this leads us into is, you know, they're a B2B business, right? Business to business company, which in order to grow your commercial sales, you know, you just, you're going to have to be a B to C, a B to customer uh, revenue driving company, right? And so because they are so specific about how they, you know, taper the software to each company, I'm not sure. You know, if they're ever going to be able to do that, but that in order to drive the commercial side, they're going to have to come up with something to sell to individuals and not just to companies. And so that's going to be huge. And the reason why is just what I said, because they're so specific about how they customize the software. I mean, even the CEO said, you know, it takes a couple of months for they even start you know, really generate any revenue from the contracts they're signed because they want to get to know the customer to figure out what they need to design for them. Well, I mean, you can't do that with obviously individuals, all of us, right? You need to be able to package something. And I figure they can come up with something. So hopefully that's what they're going to do because that's what's going to drive that commercial side like crazy. And a lot of people are hoping they can do that. We shall see. You know, the other thing to look at what we got going on right now with Russia, right? I mean, this should actually help Palantir, especially on the government side, because all you hear about is cybersecurity attacks that Russia is going to be trying to do. That's why you see the cybersecurity stocks going up and stuff. And so we'll see if, you know, and all the disinformation you see coming out of Russia right now, you know, that should obviously hopefully drive people to Palantir. This is kind of what they do. That's what the CEO said, right? They do good in bad times. Right now it's bad times, right? Geopolitically and stuff. And so, you know, the last thing we look at is the chart. You know, you saw the rebound Thursday, but it was in the red on Friday, right? When most stocks were actually green. As you can see right here, there's that last line of support. It bounced off of when they had that huge recovery, not just in Palantir, but the whole 
uh, market. It fell below 10. I think it was like 973 was the low, I believe. And then bounced, and of course, had a big day. And then, of course, it was down on Friday when most things were actually uh, green by a little bit. And then if you just go back right here, I mean, this is where that support comes from. It's actually from the IPO listing where you see it bounce off that line a few times. But below that, there is nothing. So, you know, around 975-ish, somewhere in that range, that is the last line of defense. If this stock does start to sell off, there's nothing to hold it up, you know, technically. And so that will be interesting to see what happens. If we have, I believe it'll probably move with the market more than anything else. If we have started having green weeks, this rally continues, Palantir will most likely rally. If the market sells off, a good chance it will have a lot of selling pressure on it. If the market starts to tank again, again, we're over 20 on the VIX expect volatility red and green days we're actually closing out the month so usually sometimes when you close out the month you'll get those green days and then of course tuesday will be march 1st leading us into march and i'll do another video for you guys showing you exactly how march plays out because you'll see some people saying it's a great month but i'm actually going to show you why history kind of tells us a little something different because there is a spin or something going on this year that should affect march at least it does historically as well and then of course depends on what goes on with russia and ukraine and all the sanctions and just a lot of stuff going on so we'll see uh, about that right there let me know in the comments what you guys are doing with palantir did you pick up any under 10 or did you just sell uh, as soon as earnings came out like kathy did and so if you got anything out of this hit the like subscribe button for me guys don't hit all on the notifications i really appreciate that and i'll see you guys later